Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome. I'm Rachel Barnett. I'm the Executive Director of the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina, and I want to welcome everyone tonight. Um, tonight's program is sponsored by the Pearlstein Lipoff Center for Southern Jewish Culture, KKBE Lifelong Learning, and the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina. Uh, before we get started, here's just a few of our usual housekeeping rules. Please make sure you are on mute. If you have a question, please put it in the chat box. We will take those at the end of the presentation. This event is being recorded and we wanna welcome Dale Rosengarten tonight as our moderator. Now I wanna welcome our special guest for the evening and introduce her. Sue Eisenfeld is the author of Wandering Dixie, Dispatches from the Lost Jewish South, as well as Shenandoah, A Story of Conservation and Betrayal. She is also a contributing author in the New York Times Disunion, A History of the Civil War. She writes about her passions, history, travel, culture, hiking, nature, relationships, and life. Her work has been listed five times among notable essays of the year in the Best American Essays, and her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Forward, Civil War Times, Washingtonian, the Gettysburg Review, Potomac Review, Virginia Living, and many others. She is an instructor in the MA in Writing and MA in Science Writing programs at Johns Hopkins University and she is a communications consultant in the Washington DC area. Born in Philadelphia, she is a longtime resident of Arlington, Virginia. Welcome Sue, and now Dale will kick us off. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you for, to everybody for coming. I'm really thrilled with the audience here. Um, it's difficult in these days of social distancing not to see anybody and it's wonderful to see everybody's faces. Um, Sue, apart from her other accomplishments, was a Charleston Research Fellow uh, in 2018. So we had the privilege of getting to know her a little bit while she was working on this project. Um, and I've just had a wonderful time becoming friends. Uh, so I just wanna start out by asking Sue to tell us what the book is about. Um, I've read it more than once, so I could uh, weigh in here, but from her perspective, from the author's perspective, uh, what is this book? Well, thanks, Dale. Um, well, before I, before I start, I just want to thank you and Rachel and the Pearlstein Lipoff Center for Southern Jewish Culture and KKBE and Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina for having me, for inviting me, and for supporting authors. Um, I really appreciate that. And, and thank you to everybody who's here uh, tuning into this. So what is the book about? Um, my one liner for what the book is about is that it's about Jews, the South, race, the Confederacy, and me. And it is really a travel through history journey. You could call it a travel memoir um, of me as a, a northerner by birth going to the South to sort of discover um, what turns out to be the lost Jewish communities of the South, primarily the Deep South. Um, and by that, I mean the places that were once thriving in small towns and that now have very few Jewish people left. Um, but it's the story of the lost Jewish South and the intersection of African-American history in the South combined. And it's also, I guess, my personal journey of um, discovering this history, uh, discovering my relationship with Judaism, and kind of my journey of becoming a little bit more woke in the process. Mm. So what, what is the genre uh, you're working in here? Um, I don't know if people are familiar with narrative nonfiction, but um, this is a really special uh, genre you might describe. Yeah, so um, it's not a scholarly work. Um, it is, yeah, we call it narrative nonfiction or literary nonfiction. Um, you know, as a writer, I'm I'm writing a truthful story about uh, my experiences and things that I research. Uh, but we use the techniques of fiction to sort of 
tell it in a storytelling type of way. Um, I do base a lot of my my research on on scholarly work. There's a lot of material out there. There are a lot of scholars working in the field of Southern Jewish history. So one of my hopes is that I'm amplifying that scholarship. Um, but as a travel through history memoir writer, what I'm doing in this genre is going out into the field and doing experiential or immersion reporting, um, talking to people, having conversations, doing interviews, and then sort of supporting all of that with some research, you know, both primary and secondary research. So um, although I don't consider myself in the same uh, at the same level, but some people might be familiar with some other writers that do this, like Tony Horwitz and um, even even Eric Larson, although he's much more research based. Um, but that, that's the that's the type of genre that that I uh, aspire to and that I hope that I'm I'm working in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Rachel, you want to jump in with? Yeah. So Sue, first of all, I want everybody to see Sue's backdrop, which I immediately thought, oh my gosh, you're in South Carolina. But no, her backdrop are two of the magnificent windows at Temple Sinai and Sumter. Anita, aren't they beautiful? Um, who's on here? Yes. So thank you very much for that. That's very special. And let me also say, I love the book. I'm rereading this book. It has, it really spoke to me. I read it this summer, as I told you, when um, folks were marching in the streets and it really has awoken something. I'm like you. I mean, it's, it's brought something out in me. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, how did you get interested in this subject and come to write the book? That's a great question. Um, it's a big question too. I guess I should say, you know, I've, I was born in Philadelphia, but I've been living in Virginia for almost 30 years. And in living in Virginia, you become interested in the Civil War, whether you want to or not. And so I was becoming interested in the Civil War over many years. And But it wasn't until I actually went to Richmond one day, many, many years, like 15 years after I'd already been living in, in Virginia, and I... Um, discovered the historic Hebrew cemetery there. And in, in the center of this historic Hebrew cemetery, which dates to 1816, is the Confederate section. So I, to that point, never, never really knew that there were Jews in the South at all, much less that Jews had fought for the Confederacy. Um, you know, for those of you, probably most of you who are Southerners, this is like so obvious. But for someone like me who grew up in Philadelphia, uh, where my my world view was really that Jews came to America like through New York City in around 1900 and end of story, uh, this was a real eye opener to find this cemetery. And of course, the question that it brought up for me was, you know, how could the Jews who commemorate their freedom from slavery every year at Passover have fought for the South or for the you know so-called side of slavery. This was just a question that uh, stuck in my head for many years. I mean, I I was I went to Richmond in 2006. I didn't really start writing this book in earnest till 2015. So a lot of years went by. I asked that question, um, you know, many times until I really dug into doing some research. And then once I came to understand sort of the the context of Jews fighting for the Confederacy, what I decided was that I really needed to go to the South and to see the places that they had lived and worked, uh, had their businesses and and see their synagogues and their cemeteries and, and get a sense of the environment that nurtured the Jews essentially in the South. And so, um, that's, that's sort of the origin story. I guess a part of that is also that I was actually inspired by reading Tony Horwitz's book, Confederates in the Attic, um, Dispatches from the Unfinished Civil War, I think is the subtitle. And uh, he traveled around the South trying to discover why people felt that the Civil War was sort of still so alive. And I always wanted to find a way to do my own version of that, but I knew I needed some kind of theme that was different. I couldn't just do like 
Tony Horwitz again. Um, and so once I realized that this question of the Confederate Jews was something that could propel me in my quest through the South, I, I realized that I, I sort of had something there. Um, it was originally going to be just a Civil War journey and sort of exploration of Southern culture. And then I realized that uh, actually it was, it was about the lost Jewish South. That was my intent as I got started. So, so how, how did you learn about the term Confederate Jews or Jewish Confederates? And how did you come to understand it? Who were who your guides in that? Yeah, well, probably my first guide was actually getting Robert Rosen's book, The Jewish Confederates. Uh, once, you know, once I realized that this was a thing, uh, I wanted to know everything about it. Of course, Robert Rosen's book is like a giant encyclopedia and has so much information. And, and really, once I got looking, there's so much information out there. It's almost embarrassing that, that I and, and so many Northerners know nothing about it. But what I, but what I took away from it all was, essentially, you know, where, wherever Jews landed in America, whether it was north or south, it was a better place than Jews had come from, all over the world, and the South was their sanctuary. It was their sacred, safe ground, and they were willing to fight for it. So, once I sort of came to understand the context of, or at least understand a little better, the context of the worldwide persecution of Jews, and uh, particularly the early Sephardic Jews who came to the South, and how they must have felt about America coming here with their freedom of religion, for the most part, and all of their other freedoms, that of course they would fight for wherever it was they had landed that had provided this safe space. Um, I think it was, it's just sort of a difference of perspective as a Northerner to try to look at the South that way for Jews, that um, they would they would fight to the death for their safe home. And um, so this really helped me to understand the Jewish Confederates and where they were coming from. And I mean, it's strange, I mean, this is probably obvious to, to all of you who, who grew up in it, but in a way it just, it took me a while to realize even though this was the Civil War, that this was actually a really patriotic thing in their minds, it seemed that that they were doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, like you, I'm, I'm originally from the North, so I've been here a long time and I've had a long time to learn, but um, I, I know when I arrived, people from, from back home had no idea, absolutely no idea, uh, of, of what the Southern Jewish history was all about. Yeah. You know, one, one thing I love about Wandering Dixie is the travel log structure. Um, you go places and you meet people and come away with great stories and characters. Um, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about two in particular. Uh, first, Sarah Hamm, the peanut lady of Eufalia, uh, Alabama, who you wisely chose to be your opening act. Um, and also, I'd ask you to talk about Elizabeth Moses, whom I really adored and, and worked with for years. Um, but because the book, I think, kind of reaches a climax when you get to Sumter, casting in stark relief the many of the complexities and complications you uncover in the South. So if you would talk a little bit about Sarah and about Elizabeth. Yeah. So you follow Alabama as the first place I go in the book. And I meet Sarah Ham, who is from literally the last Jewish family in that town. Um, she, you know, she is literally the first person I ever hear in my life who's Jewish and has a Southern accent, right? So she's like my introduction to the Deep South. Um, she runs a peanut warehouse. She um, grew up with the George Wallace family. I mean, I just basically stumbled upon her and she was this amazing um, font of information and lived such a Southern life. Um, by, by bringing up the fact that she grew up with the Wallace family, this 
this opens the door for me to start having conversations about race. I didn't go into this book uh, thinking I was going to write about African American history or Jews and race. That that just it wasn't really part of the original plan. Um, but she sort of opens that door. Um, and she's so interesting because she's the sole representative of Judaism in that community and actually has to go to, well, she, she is invited to go to churches to explain the Old Testament to people. Um, and there's no temple there and the cemetery is in disrepair. And, and you know, so it, it opens a lot of the themes of the book. Um, many chapters later, maybe five, six, seven chapters later, um, I meet Elizabeth Moses and and I thank you, Dale, for introducing me to her. And it was so lovely to be with her. Um, and so she is so interesting on a number of levels, but one of which was that she was working to find a way to save that temple and did succeed in saving it in contrast to Eufala, which had not find a, found a way and it was actually gone. Um, she was also, interesting in, in talking about her her and her family's struggle to sort of overcome their family slave owning past. Um, and so um, as opposed to Sarah Ham who who knew George Wallace in a way where she was able to say that she didn't think he was racist. Um, so there, you know, different people just sort of came to their relationship with with racist pasts in different ways. And those were two of, of the examples. Um, I'd be curious, Dale, if you had some other ideas about the way that the two of them sort of contrasted. Well, um, and I hope you do read the section about Elizabeth, but as, as those of us who knew her um, know, she came from uh, an intermarried family. <laughs> and uh, really found Judaism on her own terms. I'll say that. Yeah, Whereas I will, I will do seemed, that. Thing and I can do it now or yeah. I could do it later. Yeah, yeah, why don't you do that? Do it now? Sure. Okay, yeah, so this is, this is a little excerpt that, that Dale helped me uh, select from the book uh, that we wanted to honor Elizabeth Moses. Um, and uh, although those of you from Charleston and Sumter might know some of this information already, um, I guess it'll give you a, a sense of, of how I've written the book. So this is about five minutes. It's from a chapter called Where It Begins and Where It Ends. I meet Elizabeth Moses at the Sumter County Museum, an 1848 house that once belonged to her relative Octavia, Octavia Harvey Moses, daughter of a former Isaac Harvey, where Elizabeth works as the educational and outreach coordinator. When I heard that Elizabeth was an eighth generation Southern Jew, for some reason I expected her to be intimidating and aristocratic. I guess I feel out of my league in the Charleston area because of my family's short history in this country and our general lack of observant Jewishness. Instead, I find her warm, friendly, like Rosenberg, whom she's related to, down to earth and only a few years older than me in her 50s. We bond immediately over our love of history and cats. There's a friendly orange one strutting about the house, as well as our way of thinking. She says she is profoundly liberal and progressive. Also, she's wearing jeans. And one of the first things she tells me is that she was raised Catholic and officially converted to Judaism as an adult. And that whether vegetarian or nudist, all converts are nuts. As a vegetarian myself, she puts me at ease right away. I'm surprised to hear that she'd converted to Judaism though, because I had heard people mention that her father is Jewish, Robert Moses, 96, and because many different Charleston Jews had suggested I talk with her about Jewish history. Turns out her mother was a Protestant who converted to Catholicism, and part of the agreement in marriage was that the kids had to be raised Catholic which her father had said in an interview was a bitter pill to try to swallow. I had heard that many of the old Sephardic Jewish family names like Moses were no longer held by practicing Jews, that over the years, so many of them had assimilated, intermarried and converted that many of the non-Jews in Sumter have Jewish ancestors and mostly the only Jews left are from the second and third waves of Jews to this country. 
the Jews in Sumter were loved to death by the non-Jewish people, is how Robert Moses puts it. So Elizabeth Moses grew up going to Catholic school while also attending temple with her father, though he also made sure that they had a Christmas tree so she and her siblings didn't feel left out. Ashley Rivers, Lee Harvey, also remembers her Jewish family's Southern Christmas, where they made merry for weeks. Elizabeth Moses converted to Judaism at age 30. She now calls herself an unbeliever, a non-believer, though she's a devoted lay leader for Shabbat services at the temple. Her father's second wife is also Catholic, but in a twist I've not seen anywhere else in the South, this place where nothing is as it seems or as I'd expect, she holds the position of secretary of Sumter's Temple Sinai, as well as president of the Temple Sisterhood. After showing me around the high ceilinged house with walls covered in fancy framed portraits of the family, we get in my car and I follow Moses's directions to the Jewish cemetery, a few miles away on a tidy suburban street in an area that seems so flat, neat and low that we could be in the Midwest. This cemetery is much larger than the one at Cumming Street, not in a city with no high fences, the sky is wide. The name Moses appears frequently on gravestones and in addition to the Sephardic names I've seen before, like Moise, Lopez, Lazarus, and De Leon, I also notice a Suarez, yet another in the hard to believe they're Jewish collection. Familiar German and Eastern European names appear in this cemetery as well. Those names belong to the people who came later and who turned the downtown into a bustling business community. We also visit Elizabeth Moses's mother, who was buried there despite not being Jewish. According to Robert, there were Murphys buried in the Jewish cemetery and Weinbergs buried in the Catholic cemetery as a result of so much intermarriage and a general feeling of relaxedness about religion. Then Moses directs me a few blocks away to Temple Sinai, a 1912 building that's the second iteration of the synagogue, a reformed temple that welcomed any Jewish denomination since it was the only one around. It's a squat, square, Moorish revival style, red brick building on Church Street famous for its 11 stained glass windows, each about five feet wide and 20 feet tall with biblical scenes from the Old Testament. It's the only temple whose windows I can remember with images of people as opposed to just decorative symmetrical designs as strict Jewish rules prohibit the creation of images that could be considered idolatry. Here the windows depict Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and others who are portrayed with brown skin. Due to the dwindling number of people coming to services, the Sumter County Museum is taking over the building, which Robert Moses calls the light at the end of the tunnel in the face of utter sadness over the decline of the Sumter Jewish community. The Temple Sinai Jewish History Center will inhabit the adjoining social hall to provide information about Jewish history in South Carolina. And the museum will keep the temple open for Friday night and holiday services as long as people will come. In the best news I've heard on all my travels through these lost places, Elizabeth says, this place is taken care of for a long time. On the way back to the museum, we stop in the relatively bustling, rejuvenated, quaint old town of Sumter, a main street out of the 1950s with the low buildings that look like mom and pop shops, where Moses suggests we pick up Chinese food for takeout, thus proving to me that she's truly Jewish. Then we sit down to eat in the old house, where I assume all of my enlightenment of Sumter Jewish history will come to a close. Instead, she mentions offhandedly that on her mother's side, she's related to the wife and children of William Tecumseh Sherman, the man known in the South as a villain, war, war criminal, and devil. And on her dad's side, she's related to the half-Jewish robber governor, Franklin J. Moses Jr., a man two other Charleston Jews had mentioned to me as the Scalawag governor the only time my sheltered northern ears had ever heard the word scalawag spoken. Moses, I'll learn, was the controversial Reconstruction era governor of South Carolina that generations of Southerners still revile, who in his earlier life was a devoted Confederate who raised the Confederate flag over Fort Sumter at the start of the war. According to historian Benjamin Ginsburg of Johns Hopkins University, Franklin Moses Jr. in complete defiance of Southern white norms supported the federal government's Freedmen's Bureau, which assisted newly freed blacks. He also launched social programs for blacks, integrated state institutions, built a black militia to protect freedmen's rights, 
helped Blacks attend state universities, visited the homes and churches of his Black constituents, invited Black people to his home to socialize, and insisted that Blacks be treated with respect. Although no one denies that he did some small-time thieving and engaged in corruption while in office, according to Ginsburg, if Moses was a robber, what he stole was not so much white South Carolinians' money as their sense of racial exclusivity. So that's just a little excerpt and maybe a controversial one. <laughs> you know, I, I just have to say, uh, when, when I started working for the Jewish Heritage Collection, uh, we're putting together the exhibit portion of the people. And of course, I was very interested in uh, Franklin J. Moses. And I'll never forget um, Anita Rosenberg saying to me that if we included him in the exhibit, we would not get so much as a handkerchief from Sumter. And it turned out not to be true. We included a lot about Franklin J. Moses. We had his desk and we had his top hat and we had his uh, a campaign banner. Uh, and people came and nobody freaked out. But um, <laughs> it's true, is he is was the most reviled character in the entire history that uh, that we were trying to tell. Um, but moving on, but maybe not too far on, um, during during the civil rights era, uh, the Jewish community's stand, do you say, uh, was not to take a stand. Um, how did your itinerary expand to encompass civil rights sites? So um, a couple of things happened on my journeys. You know, my my trips were um, somewhat planned and somewhat spontaneous. So I would try to go with like whatever was happening. Um, it, something I had in the back of my mind that did wind up influencing my travels is that I'm related to Andrew Goodman. He was my distant cousin and um, he was one of the three civil rights workers who was murdered in Mississippi in 1964. And I knew I was gonna be going through that area from Philadelphia to Meridian. I also found myself on the path from Selma to Montgomery, uh, just in traveling, like literally I was going to be traveling across the, straight, the state and uh, I realized this is the uh, civil rights landscape that I, I can't really ignore. Um, and I wound up uh, calling up uh, a, a guy in Selma and having this amazing experience talking to him about the Jews and civil rights. And what he basically taught me and was the first person to, to do that was, was the perspective of Southern Jews, which I did not have. I had the perspective of Northern Jews and, and people that, you know, Andrew Goodman and my family and others that had gone down South to try to do good. And, and what he taught me was there was this gray area where Southern Jews may have wanted to support civil rights, but they were actually fearful of what kind of risks uh, this would impose on their lives. Um, the Northern Jews could go home after they had agitated and done all of their work. But the Southern Jews had to stay and live side by side with their non-Jewish neighbors who might be citizen council or KKK. And, and lived in this sort of fragile um, trust of those um, white Christian neighbors. And at the same time, you know, many of these Jews were store owners, of course, they wanted to um, keep their black customers happy. And so they were just in this very difficult space of um, maybe wanting to participate in activism, but sort of being fearful for their businesses and their lives. And so this was, um, this is early in the book that I discuss this, you know, like I said, it's the first time that I, I get this perspective of Southern Jews during civil rights. And um, as I continue my travels, I just continue to be drawn to learning about the African American history and seeing the ways in which Jews and African Americans have intersected through that history, both in terms of civil rights and um, in terms of slavery. So that that does actually become a theme of the book, and it it wasn't something that I had set out to do. It just sort of happened organically. Mm -hmm. um, 
You call your travels a transformative journey and talk about them as a pub personal reckoning. How did you change uh, in this process? Well, in terms of the um, African American history that I explore, you know, this I started. I started this book in in 2015. I started my travels, I should say, in 2015, two months after the Charleston shooting. So just to so you understand the context in which I was traveling, this suddenly America, white America, is having more conversations about race, about how this could have happened, and I'm doing my travels all through during and after the 2016 presidential election, and I'm traveling um, into the year after the Charlottesville situation. So different kinds of conversations are happening in America. And I am in some of the places where similar things had happened in the 1960s. So it was kind of like the past was replaying itself in the present and giving me like uh, an education of, of history as, it, as it's happening all over again. So I am in the process inevitably just sort of becoming more woke. I mean, I'm, I don't think I ever really understood before these travels what institutional racism really meant. I also didn't really understand or were able to talk about white privilege. And these, these things were becoming more evident to me as I was doing my own travels. So for example, I went to Tuskegee Institute I was fascinated by Booker T. Washington. I wanted to go see this place. Um, you know, this is a, a college that freed Blacks had to build themselves. The first students literally built the buildings, made the bricks, built their furniture. Um, and this was in 1865. And I'm thinking the schools that became the Ivy League had already been open for more than 100 years before that. So just in that one thing alone, like white people had more than 100 years head start in education. I guess I had just never um, seen or been close up to something in such stark relief, just as a small example. So so the book is kind of my journey of, of understanding these issues. And, and I'm actually hoping that it, it maybe will open uh, open the eyes of some readers as well. But because the book is also a Jewish book, um, I found myself, you know, sitting in services in more temples than I had been in like my entire life. Um, probably being around more Jews than I had been around for quite a long time. I mean, I live in a large metropolitan area, but, and I have, <clears throat> excuse me, Jewish friends, but I um, don't belong to a synagogue. And I, I, so I was sort of immersed in, in more Jewishness than I had been. And it was causing me to examine um, my relationship to Judaism and, um, you know, whether I, I evaluating whether I wanted to um, sort of take my relationship with Ju Judaism further. And so the book examines those things as well. Those are some of the areas that I guess I feel I, I had a personal journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it appears from your writing that it actually changed some of your behaviors in terms of starting to bring people to, um, you know, for voter registration and whatnot. Um, it, it sort of inspired you to become a bit more of an activist. Yeah, I did start to get more involved in my own community. I had these visions of wishing that I could go to Mississippi and, and do things. And I thought, well, I can just start right here in Arlington, Virginia. And so uh, since 2016, I have been more involved than I had been ever in my adult life in political mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. voting rights in particular. Mm hmm. So th this is a, a bit of a selfish question, but you know, as we, I mentioned, you were a Charleston Research Fellow uh, for, actually you came for two, a two week stint. Um, how did that affect the writing of the book? 
I was so lucky and so grateful to have that fellowship. Um, you know, being there for that time allowed me to be really immersed in Charleston. And, and to be honest, winning the fellowship meant that I was supposed to use the special collections and the Jewish um, heritage uh, collection. And so knowing that that was sort of part of my duty made me do more research, I think, than perhaps I would have on my own. Um, and also just do free form research. I didn't even necessarily know what I was looking for, but I had so much interesting stuff to examine. So for example, I saw this original like 1783 map of um, that, that was in the special collections of one of the properties that one of the Jewish slave owners I was looking into had owned. Now I could no longer go over there. Um, I sort of had to look at it from across the river, but I had this original map of the slave owner's land and where everything was. So that was just, it helped me understand um, that situation. It was great to be able to touch it and, you know, hold on to that map. So, so it allowed me to have great immersion. It also just, it made me learn more about Charleston than maybe I would have if I was just passing through. Some of these places I literally spent half a day in and, um, but Charleston, I, I got, you know, my 10 days. So it yielded two chapters of my book. In this book about lost communities, Charleston is not a lost Jewish community, but I have two chapters about Charleston. Um, you know, maybe all that I really knew, generally speaking, about Charleston was it was where the Civil War began, uh, but it was where I got to explore early uh, Reform Judaism in America. Um, you know, learning that 40% of all the slaves that came to America came through Charleston opened up uh, opportunities to kind of explore that a little bit. And like I said, I was especially interested. I knew that somewhere in the book I wanted to examine. Jewish slave owners, and that's uh, something I wound up doing in Charleston. Um, I, I have to say, I think that my favorite chapters are the ones that take place in Charleston, and I think it's because I had the richest experience there and was able to um, really absorb. Mm -hmm. I, I would be hard pressed to say which were my favorite chapters, but of course, everyone loves reading about people they know. and. <laughs> I was absolutely entranced. Um, I, I also want to ask you, um, I love the way you identify the de demographics of every place you visit. You say 50% black, 44% white, 6% other, or whatever the, 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 the percentages are. Jews enjoyed white skin privilege, as you point out, but they also were some sort of other. Uh, where did you count the Jews in the population? That's a great question. Um, the numbers are literally from the census. So the question of how Jews report themselves in the census is not something I can really answer. Um, I think you bring up an interesting point, though, which is that some Jews identify as white and some Jews don't. And I know that for some people that is a, a new concept, but I think you know, what people are talking about now is that white is not necessarily, ha um, you know, what you consider your heritage. It's sort of the privileges that you acquire by by what you look like and, um, and, that, and how people treat your sort of category. Um, some Jews that I've spoken to said they never considered themselves white because they've always been subject to anti-Semitism and thus they don't receive the benefits of white privilege. Um, so that's an interesting um, conversation to have. And, you know, we just had the census. So I was able to ask some of my Jewish colleagues, how did you report yourself on the census? Because you can say whatever you want. Um, you know, we all probably have just done this, right, in the last few months. Um, most people I spoke with, and this is totally not scientific, but checked off white in the sort of five or six racial categories. And then there's another um, box where you can, they ask about your family origin, something, your country of origin or your ethnic origin or something like that. And some people wrote European, 
Some people wrote Eastern European, some people wrote Ashkenazi, some people wrote Sephardic, people wrote all kinds of stuff, all the Jews that I was discussing. And I'm thinking, I, th to, I thought to myself, I don't even know if the Census Bureau is gonna know what to do with Ashkenazi. I mean, it's not a country, it's, it, it doesn't generally appear as a, a category that you can check off. So I don't know how Jews are counted, but really I think it depends on how they report themselves. So that's a really long answer to your question. Um, the real answer is I got it from the census. I wanted to just give readers a sense of you know, a lot of these small communities like in Mississippi, for example, are um, very African-American. And um, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about that given that some of the political leaders are, are still all white and yet the population is very heavily African-American. So, there's some different dynamics that go on in these communities. And when you see the population information, it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're gonna keep on going, but I just wanna remind folks, if you have questions, please put them in chat. So, and we'll take them, okay? Sorry, go ahead, Dale. Well, Rachel, the next question's yours. So would you ask the small town Jewish life question? Small town Jewish life. Sure. Small town Jewish life has all but disappeared from the towns you visited. Yet there are those that keep the flame alive. So what do you think is going to happen to Jewish history in these little towns once all those souls folks are gone? And do you have, see any efforts uh, to document the history? or preserve the synagogues. And also I'm most concerned and, and curious about cemeteries. We have several small uh, synagogues in South Carolina. So, you know, that are part of the, of what we're looking in to see what can be done. Sumter of course is a great poster child of a synagogue that was saved, like you said, but yeah. you know, I'm really interested particularly in Alabama, Mississippi, those, in those areas. Well, so in terms of the cemeteries, I I actually don't know how they can be saved because none of the information that I was able to find really had anything to do with preserving cemeteries. The cemeteries seemed like it was private funds or, well, there's one situation I'll tell you about in a moment, but, but the cemeteries I'm very concerned about. In terms of the synagogues, there are efforts that are going on to help protect some places. I'm sure you know, um, and maybe a lot of the audience members know of the Institute of Southern Jewish Life is involved with some projects to preserve buildings, but also there's the Jewish Community Legacy Project. Mm -hmm. They are involved with helping small congregations, North and South, that are on the way out, figure out how to preserve the building, the sacred objects, you know, what to do next. And so um, there's a few dozen communities on their list, if you look up their website, that they're working with to try to find a plan. So, and then, you know, the places I went had all kinds of different ways that they were saving themselves. Um, Sumter became a museum. Um, St. Francisville, Louisiana is one of the communities. Um, their little synagogue, there's no Jews left, but the Julius Freyhan um, Association or um, foundation, um, a foundation who is named after the town's benefactor, who is a Jewish guy, has preserved the synagogue as an event space. Um, same with Natchez, Mississippi. That's one of the ISJL projects where it's it's being preserved as an event space and an arts facility. Um, Vicksburg, Mississippi is the one I was gonna mention about the cemetery. Um, the Jewish cemetery is adjacent to the, um, the Vicksburg military park. And so they've worked out an agreement with the National Park Service that since their congregation is pretty much defunct um, as I understand it, the Park Service is going to take over that deconsecrated building and in exchange take care of the Jewish cemetery in perpetuity. So that was a sad but amazing um, agreement that they came to because that's such a big commitment. Um, 
Port Gibson, Mississippi is another small uh, synagogue. There's no Jews left. It's a beautiful red Moorish building. Um, a private individual purchased that building. So it's completely up to him to preserve it, which he is. Uh, but then, you know, there's places like I mentioned, like Ufala, there's no temple, cemeteries in disrepair. Um, there's Clarksdale, Mississippi was another place I went where both of the synagogues of that community are no longer active. One is a private home, one belongs to a church. Um, I believe there is one man who is um, funding the cemetery uh, maintenance. And then there's Selma, Alabama. That's another uh, great one to talk about. When I was there, um, the man, the, the president of the congregation there where there were like four Jews left was very um, hopeless, I think, about what was going to happen to the Selma synagogue, which is which was so sad, not only because of the long history of Jews there, but because it's the civil rights location. There's so much happened there that involved Jews. Um, but since I was there, um, a professor in Virginia, actually, uh, Dr. Amy Milligan, who I was just in conversation with the other night um, about my book, she has started a fundraising project. She has helped them gain a lot of publicity. And I think that they might have a bright future now that um, they have like an infusion of new ideas for how to try to save themselves. So I think there's hope, um, but I think like so many kinds of projects, it really takes sometimes like one person who is just the advocate for a place. And because so mm -hmm. much money is sometimes involved though, with these rehabilitations, it, it does take people with a lot of money to participate as well. Um, I have to say that one of the reasons I wanted to write this book after I started traveling was in the hopes that maybe some people would read it and want to open their pocketbooks and donate. So actually on my website, sueisenfeld.com, I have a link um, called Sadaka that lists some of the um, organizations that people can donate to if they want to that goes directly to them uh, to try to help save these places and the Cumming Street um, cemetery is is one of the ones listed because I know that they are also trying to raise money to preserve that historic cemetery mm -hmm. very nice um, yeah it's it's very um, troubling but also inspiring uh, and I think the Cumming Street in particular is a great example of the extraordinary dedication of a couple of individuals who've just won't, you know, won't let it become a ruin. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I do want to encourage if anyone in the audience has um, other examples to share of either places that are going, going under or, or not, uh, please, please feel free. Um, so um, I'm going to keep going, Kim, until you tell me to switch to the chat. But um, so one one of your guides uh, admonished your husband Neil uh, at the end of your meeting. Tell her to be kind to the South. What what do you think he meant? And do you think you have been? Yeah, that was in Natchitoches, Louisiana. Um, we met with a lovely elderly gentleman who had been actually taking care of the Jewish cemetery his whole life and had passed down that job to his son, even though the two of them were no longer Jewish. Uh, they had descended from Jews, but had converted. Anyway, he was very interesting. And he was telling me that he was very sad that that year, which was 2016, the town of Natchitoches had decided that in the Christmas parade, they were no longer gonna be allowed to wave the Confederate flag. Um, usually Natchitoches had all the flags of the countries that that land used to belong to. So there was Spanish and French and West Florida and the United States and Confederate. And so the Confederate flag was no longer allowed and he wanted to know what I thought of that. And I gave him a very measured answer, you know, because I think that I, I can see both sides of issues and I try to be an open minded person. But I think that he had doubts about that, given that I'm a northerner 
and was afraid of how that situation in that little town was going to be portrayed, which is why he told my husband to tell me to be kind to the South. I, I think that I have been kind to the South in my book. I think that I have examined issues um, not just on the surface that I've that I've gotten into deeper issues and try to really understand individual people's motivation, um, how they learned about things from their family and and through history, and to not just come at it with um, with a closed mind. I think there's there's much to learn. I still have much to learn, but I think that um, I've tried to be fair fair, accurate, and open-minded to the South. And, and you know, frankly, in, in doing my research and my travels, I've really come to love the South. I have lived in Virginia, like I said, almost 50 years, and I, I um, generally have respect for all people and their beliefs for the most part. So, um, you know, I, I'm hoping that um, my Southern readers will agree that I have been fair. Um, Rachel, I want to turn it back to you um, to to ask you the, the last question on our list here. Yeah, because um, I know that this is a subject that really um, touched a touched a chord. Yeah, um, I'm interested in what do you think your what do you hope your readers will take away after reading the book? I said my own awakening has to do with the systemic racism that's pervasive in small towns like the tiny little town I grew up in, in South Carolina. But also it's what I term micro racism. That's the awakening has taken place in the fact that it's in the normal, what we term, I'm putting that in quotes, normal remarks that I would hear, not now, not where I am today, but looking back and thinking back of my childhood in the sixties and seventies. So, you know, it's a it's like looking through a looking glass to think, gee, that was then. So how do we move past this and um, and into a brighter world? I'm I'm guessing is self-awareness and being aware of this and talking and conversation uh, might be a good start. But do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I I, th I think I would agree with you there. And I think <clears throat> you know, I've I think I'm trying to look at it like not so much moving past, but being in the present of where we are now, which is that we, at least I'll, I'll speak for myself, but you know, we white people are being given an opportunity to really hear and learn and be able to make change. And I'm, I'm just so impressed with the younger people today who are leading the way in change and, and the way I'm trying to approach things is being grateful for the opportunity to learn and listen and try not to be stuck in ways of thinking about things just because that's how I thought about them in the past, but being open you know, to new ideas um, and learning about what things mean and how they really play out. Like I think in the past, it was harder. We didn't have the same vocabulary we have now. You know, for some people, including myself, we really didn't have an um, understanding, for example, of redlining. Mm -hmm. That term has been used for a long time, but not among everyday people, mm -hmm. right? And I know that that just as one example, that it's something I heard a lot, like growing up. You know, why why are poor black people living in those communities? There's there is always a sort of blame associated with that, like you know, like it was their fault somehow, right? Because we didn't have either information or language to talk about things like redlining, that you no, know, actually white people did that. It was a very specific government policy that federal, you know, that the federal government in support with state and local governments did to people. So I think we're really, um, we have a great benefit now of having more information, more language and an openness to, to discussing these kinds of issues. I think that is the path forward. Um, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert on this. I can just say that that's, it's part of my journey. And, and what's interesting is that, you know, all of us are in different places in our journey. Um, I've had some readers, 
you know, write to me and say things like, I had to work hard to get to where I am and, and don't yet understand that that may be true, but the color of your skin was not one of the things that caused your life to be difficult. Um, you know, this is a, a white person who was writing to me. And so, you know, it takes a while sometimes to understand and then to, to move forward. And, and I'm hoping that, you know, that we're all on, on that journey right now. I certainly think there's more awareness out there. And I'm like you, I have two 20 somethings and I'm just so impressed with this generation. Yeah. Yeah. So I have mm -hmm. high hopes. So we have some questions, Dale. Can you see the questions also? Um, I see more comments than questions. Okay. Um, well, I have a couple here. So should we go with these go right now? Okay. Uh, did you find in your research that one of the reasons so many slaves came through Charleston was that the original slaveholders were from Barbados, some of whom were Jewish plantation owners in Barbados who brought slaves with them? Also, did you find in your research in the South that the sole reason for the Civil War was to preserve slavery and states' rights were just a smokescreen? Um, in answer to the question one, I mean, that is that is something that I heard. I, I really don't have a complete reason why 40% of all um, slaves came through Charleston. I mean, I think it was one of, one of the big ports. Um, and in terms of whether states' rights was a smokescreen, so what I what a lot of people like to say is that um, the reason for the war, what a lot of people in the South I think like to say is the reason for the war was that the North wouldn't let the South secede. Um, but of course, my understanding really, if you read the articles of secession for many of the Southern states is the reason they wanted to secede was because they wanted to preserve slavery. So it's kind of like a two part step by step uh, answer, you know, that that is how we came to the Civil War. Um, I do believe that there was, you know, based on, on research that other people have done, there was definitely a campaign in the early 1900s to rewrite the history of the Civil War to um, pretty up the reasons why uh, the South fought the war, uh, which is we call the lost cause now. I mean, um, the Daughters of the Confederacy, the Little Ladies Memorial Associations rewrote textbooks, um, put George Washington and Robert E. Lee together in school buildings to associate the two generals on equal on an equal plane and a whole variety of other activities to try to normalize um, Confederate history and to take some of the shame away, I think. And what's interesting to me is that people who grew up with that, like earnestly believe that that's what children were taught and and who can blame them for growing up and having been taught those things um, to then feel that that there were legitimate reasons other than slavery for the war to have been fought but um it's been fascinating for me to see how um those descriptions of of why the South went to war uh, changed over the years. I mean, it's a great area of scholarship that lots of people are uh, writing about. And it, and it is something that I do talk about in the book. Okay, another topic uh, from David Popowski. My niece, Carly Berlin, daughter of my sister Martha of New Orleans by way of Atlanta, authored Be for a Blessing in the Oxford American this past August. It also focuses on small town Jewish life. Hmm. Have you had a chance to see the piece or by, by chance meet her? No, I haven't. And um, I would love to. So if you want to send me a link to it on my website, cweisenfeld.com, I would love to see it. Thank you. Sure. David, do you hear that? <laughs> He's on there somewhere. Okay. Um, we have some comments. Uh, Ron Olinsky points out in New York State, a defunct synagogue cemetery is taken over by New York State, as is any cemetery that cannot sustain itself. 
That's interesting. Well, maybe that's New York State. I don't think that happens down here necessarily, but maybe each state's different. Um, somebody else writes, it's my understanding that the Catholic Church in St. Francisville currently plays some part in the caretaking of the Jewish cemetery there. So. You know, that may be in St. Francisville. When I was there, there was one woman left who was like half Jewish or not Jewish, I can't remember, who was taking care of the cemetery and she was an elderly woman and they seemed to be a little concerned that there was no one left. But I um, did not investigate that one thoroughly, so I don't know about the role of the Catholic Church and its preservation. I did go to the cemetery and it didn't look horrible. Um, so that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, all these towns, they work out different arrangements, I suppose. So um, in Savannah, the two original Jewish cemeteries, which were private and located in downtown Savannah, are now maintained by Mikvah Israel. So again, a different, another arrangement. Yeah, that's great. So Dale? Um, I just saw a question from Nita. Um, Sue, could you talk to us about what you're working on now? Yeah, I'm curious about that too. I'm usually quite hesitant to talk about my next project because it could change. Um, and, I, and I haven't gotten too deep in it, but I'll tell you about two things. One is not a book project, but I'm working on writing. Um, and, I, and I saw Bonnie Eisenman here and I've been talking with her about this. She knows I'm working on writing about Moses Ezekiel, the sculptor. He um, is a fascinating figure to me. For those who don't know him, he uh, was born in Richmond. He was the first Jewish Confederate at the Virginia Military Institute and fought in the Battle of Newmarket as a cadet. Um, so staunch Southerner, staunch Confederate, practicing Jew, um, went on to become a sculptor, sculptor, and actually several of his sculptures are being taken down now in the monument um, controversy that we're in. And so I'm, I'm very interested in writing about the complexities that he embodies, although I don't think it will be a book length work. Um, the other thing I'm interested in is um, slave slave revolt history. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. I'm not quite sure what my approach is going to be. I think it might be a slightly different creative approach, possibly even fiction. Um, but looking into um, the histories of slave revolts in the US and um, elsewhere. Wow. <laughs> um so we've gone a little bit over our time, um, but I think, Rachel, are we at the end of our questions I, from the chat? We are. I, I see no more, but let me all encourage you to please um, go to Sue's website, um, sueisenfeld.com. You can purchase the book there. I, I really encourage you to read it. I mean, if you haven't, if you just got a taste of it tonight, but I thoroughly enjoyed this book. Um, like I said, I couldn't put it down this summer. It was- Thank uh, you. And I'm rereading it now and even picking up more. So it's really good. And I wanna thank Sue for joining us. Um, we wanna encourage you to please um, sign up at jwst at cfc.edu so you can get all the notices that of other upcoming programs. And um, Dale, any last thoughts? Um, I think Sue just suggested that you can also buy it from a local bookstore right. uh, rather than Amazon and try to support small businesses. Yeah, support your terrible. local booksellers. We're trying to keep them all going for sure. Yeah. yeah. I really want to thank everybody for coming and especially Sue for a really enlightening, fantastic book and an enlightening talk um, and for becoming a great friend and a great friend to the Jewish Heritage Collection in, in Charleston. Well, thank you so much, Dale. As I've told you, and I'll say publicly, you have been super helpful in opening doors for me, introducing me to folks and helping me with research and, and being a great cheerleader. So I appreciate you very much. Thank you for inviting well, me. Well, I'm happy to do it, but of course you realize it's also my job. 
<laughs> but it's enjoyable. It's nice to have a job that allows me to help people who do such a fantastic, such fantastic work. I really do mean that. It's the, it's the greatest pleasure um, is facilitating books like yours. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you.